Article 218E of the Constitution of Ghana. The functions of the Commission shall be defined and prescribed by Act of Parliament and shall include the duty to investigate all instances of alleged or suspected corruption and the misappropriation of public money by officials and to take appropriate steps including reports to the Attorney General and the Auditor General resulting from such investigations. So as we always do, this is the segment we call the Law 101. So that by the time we are done with this one hour discussion and at a point an interaction with you, if you forgot everything, you don't forget Article 218E of the Constitution, which deals with some of the functions of the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice. So what we just heard, what does it mean? What can you learn from it? Today, we have the Commissioner of the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Shraj, Joseph Wetal, with us to educate us. So thank you so very much. Thank you. We deem it such a rare privilege to have you spend your afternoon with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Right. So on our Law 101, what does it actually mean when it comes to the duties of charge to investigate all instances of alleged or suspected corruption and the misappropriation of public money by officials and to take appropriate steps, including reports to the Attorney General and the Auditor General resulting from such investigations. All right, thank you, Samson. And right. um, in brief, the whole essence of Article 218E is what we call the informal complaint system that enables the commission and you know any other person to bring an action or to bring a in this case not a complaint but make allegations in public through the media through public uh, fora and others and the commission over the years has practiced the the the, the process of mm. looking at how often those allegations have hit the media landscape right uh, in the public domain and use that as a basis for undertaking an investigation in respect of corruption, that is allegations of corruption, mm. suspicions of corruption, and also uh, misappropriation of public money by public officials. Is there not a coalition here, now that we have set up the office of the special prosecutor to deal with corruption? No, 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 I don't think so. I don't think so, because one, the commission is the constitutional body right. established to ensure that corruption is fought under Article 35.7, as you are aware of. Now, an addition of the Office of Special Prosecutor, mm. is, it goes to support the multi-system that we are practicing in the country. Okay. Don't forget, corruption is not only fought mm. by charge and the Office of the Special Prosecutor. Mm -hmm. We also have the police. We have the Auditor General. We have the e Economic and Organized Crime Office. We have the Narcotics Control Commission. All these bodies are fighting corruption in one way or the other. And so an addition of the, my good friend, uh, Kise Jebeng, mm. the Special Prosecutor and his mm. office, mm. to fight corruption and corruption-related offenses only makes the game fairer. Right. Right. Thank you very much. So what is the most significant part of this particular provision, uh, Article 218E, for you that you want uh, our viewers to take note of? 
the, the significant part of Article 218E, one, is the whole issue of allowing allegations and suspicions aired by citizens of Ghana in whatever way, public fora, media, and any other place, to be the basis for which the commission can take action. All right. There are some instances where people may not come forward. Mm. The reason being that corruption is a victimless uh, offense. Right. It's a state that suffers when a public officer doesn't uh, go along with, the issue, uh, with his work and is corrupt. It's not you and me personally. Mm. So to limit it to a complaint, when a complainant may not be willing to come forward, we would be doing ourselves a lot of injustice. And sure. I think the framers of the Constitution saw that mm. there was a need to enable an aspect, particularly of corruption, mm. to be brought before the Commission through what we call informal complaints, allegations, suspicions, poured out into the media, poured out at public fora. Right. Yeah. So that is some good education for you. And uh, we're going to continue from this point. And there's something that you know, comes to my mind immediately that for the maker of the law mm -hmm. to come to the conclusion that there could be circumstances where the public or members of the public would be unwilling mm -hmm. to come to you and lodge a complaint for which you should be allowed to investigate. What would be the motivation for that? Is it that people... Uh, the circumstances where people are afraid of retaliation and so on? Very much. As you, 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 you can find in the Afrobarometer report. That is right. People may feel that if they report a matter that is not directly affecting their pocket, mm -hmm. they may be victimized. Yes. Their employer may take them out of a job. Other people who hold uh, their life support may pull it that's right and so there's a need to have an opportunity to allow the institutions of state right. to be able to attend to a, a problem of corruption mm. and misappropriation of public money without necessarily having a, an identifiable complaint and come forward right i think that is the essence and and for those of you who remember very well between 2007 and 2008 this became such a major debate and some have misconstrued what the conclusion was, and continue to think that Shraj is unable to trigger its investigative processes without a complaint being tendered or submitted to it by an, an identifiable individual complainant. In that matter, uh, the Supreme Court uh, had one thing to say, that they believe that if they adopt your your thinking about how they are supposed to interpret the provisions of the Constitution. Of course, that was excluding um, E. Mm -hmm. It said that, uh, this is George Wood speaking, I guess, mm -hmm. said, in my estimation, what you, the Shraj was thinking, was unworkable, if not impossible. Responsibility of monitoring the entire media landscape on a daily basis and monitoring all public fora being held across the, the entire country. Those being held in the cities, towns, villages, chiefs' palaces, offices, whenever and wherever a forum of every kind is being held with regard to all the matters listed in not only Article 218A, but also Article 218B and C. The court felt that the majority view was that that would be to give yourself too much work. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on that? Well, um, I stand... So that you just sit, fold your arms, wait until somebody brings a complaint, you don't do anything. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think... Um, let me, let's, this is the case in which the, um, Dr. Isaac Anani... Richard Anani. Uh, Richard Anani, right. who was an interested party... That's right. ...brought... Was being, uh, had been investigated by the commission. The commission fi made findings of um, one conflict of interest, abuse of office, and That's perjury. Right. That's right. He was dissatisfied. 
He went to, to the High Court and applied for judicial review. There was also corruption against him, but you didn't yeah. find him there were guilty no findings. of corruption. There were no findings right. of corruption. Mm. So he couldn't have brought that uh, you know, for judicial review. That's right. So uh, he applied for Cicerera to question the decision of the commission. And Bafoboni J.A., who was then an additional high court judge, who sat on the matter, yeah. agreed with his counsel and said the commission proceeding on the basis of Article 218A, that is very, very crucial. That's right. Should not have made findings against them mm. because there was no complaint by an identifiable complainant before the commission. Right. And yes, to that extent, I agree with him. Mm. Of course, his reasons were that 218A uh, the species of complaints there are about abuse of office, corruption, which must, become, must be brought by a complaint, mm. and um, unfair treatment by a public officer of any person. Right. Now, in the absence of a complaint, if you make findings of abuse of office and uh, conflict of interest, which is in Article 284 and 287, mm and which they later on went on to interpret, right. it would be a problem. So I agree with uh, Bafu Bonnie at the time. All right. The commission was not satisfied. We went to the, to Supreme, the Supreme Court, Court one, to, um, to quash Bafu Bonnie's uh, you know, ruling, and also for the court to indicate to the court that Bafu Bonnie had actually gone beyond his jurisdiction mm. by interpreting Article 218A. And I think when the job of interpretation of the Constitution is that of the Supreme Court. Of the Supreme Court. And I think he was right. I mean, we, the Commission was right. Right. So the Supreme Court went ahead and so motu referred the matter to itself. Right. That is after it had dismissed perjury, dismissed uh, the, the Commission's uh, application for perjury and abuse of office. Right. Because Obviously, there was no complaint. Right. Now, it reserved to itself the interpretation of Article 218A. Mm. And that is what is very crucial. Right. And in the process, it actually looked at the whole structure of 218A in total mm. and brought a lot of clarity to the Commission's work. And that is why we are proceeding with for now. Right. Yeah. Uh, so the education here is that if you hear the refrain in some quarters, that suggests that the Supreme Court has ever said, or any court has ever said, that Shrad cannot investigate without a complain, a complainant, or a complaint brought by an, indiv an identifiable individual complaint, then that is a wrong interpretation of what the Supreme Court said. There is the 218E that was not affected. What was affected was 218A, which says that the functions include to investigate complaints of violations of fundamental rights and freedoms, injustice, corruption, abuse of, abuse of power, and unfair treatment of any person by a public officer in the exercise of his official duties. So in respect of the investigations regarding the abuse of um, uh, power and uh, the other one. Injustice. Right. Conflict, uh, uh, conflict of, of interest. Conflict of interest yes. came mm. in later. Right. Yeah, that is an article. There's a need for an individual to make a complaint. Yes. But when you go to the uh, 218E, which we have shared with you already, they don't need anybody to file any complaint. And so that is on your screens once again. Now, later on, were you surprised that a member of the court itself, Justice Dateba, writing in his book, Reflections on the Supreme Court of Ghana, had disagreed with the majority decision and said that for a developing country like Ghana, Shrad should have been allowed the manner in which it wanted the provision interpreted. If you know 
just that about who I had to the opportunity to work with even mm -hmm. off the bench right because we were together at the data protection commission right this is a man who looks at the law from a very broad perspective he saw the commission as a vehicle for development right and to take a strict and narrow interpretation would mean you are you are limiting the commission mm. that is where he departed from his colleagues. Yeah. So this is what he actually said. Right. He says, the impact of the Anani case on the fight against abuse of human rights makes it a very significant leading case. Shrad combines the functions of three different institutions, an anti-corruption agency, an ombudsman, dealing with, dealing with writing administrative injustice in the public sector, and a third one, a human rights agency. Proactivity is required for the effective performance of all these three functions. The decision in the Anani case has had a negative impact on all three functions. So significant is the case that the Constitution Review Commission has recommended that the principle it embodies should be reversed. Among the recommendations for constitutional change made by the Commission is one that Shraj should have the power to initiate investigations without a formal complaint for all aspects of its mandate. Given that the word complaint was ambiguous in its context and could mean both what the majority and dissenting just justices interpreted it to mean, policy considerations should have weighed heavier with the court in order to avert the diminution in the role of Shraj that resulted from the decision of the court. This case reinforces the present writer's view that the legal and judicial processes in a developing country context should be functionalist in their jurisprudential orientation. Well, something I certainly agree with the <laughs> eminent jurist. Right. And, and to be honest with you, mm. this view is shared by a number of countries. I happen to be the vice chair of the Network of African Human Rights Commissions. Mm. And almost in about 34 out of the 54 human rights commissions in Africa, including the ombudsman, mm. the opportunity to bring up, to undertake so motu investigations without the need for a complaint by the human rights commissions throughout Africa is now the way to go. All right. So if he says that, he's not wrong. If the Constitutional Review Commission also recommends that, they're right. Yeah. Because we must go beyond the narrow confines of what the framers of the Constitution thought of the commission at the time. Now we are looking at is it a vehicle for, the, 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 for ensuring that we are able to hold power accountable, mm. to make citizens who are otherwise vulnerable and may not be able to bring complaints or even know their rights, the opportunity for their, their issues to be taken up by the commission? That is, the, that is what we should be looking at. All right. And I'm believing that in the, in the hope that the next opportunity to review the, com, the, com, the Constitution, we should be looking at that. All right. Coming forward. Okay. Right. Uh, thank you very much. And this afternoon, uh, we are privileged to have um, Commissioner Joseph Wittal um, of the Shraj. And so, could you help us understand, you know, what type of complaint is admissible? Because people always think about it. I want to bring a complaint. I don't know what form it should take. I'm not too sure this thing I'm taking, whether they will accept it or they will not accept it. So what type of complaint is acceptable? Who can bring a complaint? Um, what form of complaint um, should we be looking at when we want to come to you? And uh, how can I submit it in your office? Right. Thank you. Um, Samson, the, the, the courts are very technical. And the commission's establishment under the constitution is meant to complement the courts. Right. So whilst one is technical, the other one is expected not to be technical to allow, and that's why we, 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 don't, we don't take any fees. Uh, you, you come, you just trigger it based on your complaint. So the nature of the complaint will depend on what you want the commission to look at. 
Is it a human right? Even if you are not a lawyer, or you don't even have a lawyer, reflect in writing or orally what you think your problem is. It is the, the duty of the commission to formulate the nature of the complaint for you and the nature of the relief that you are seeking for you. And that becomes the basis of a complaint. So it can be written, it can be oral. I'm hearing this for the first time. It can be oral? It can be oral. And so uh, an illiterate person can walk into Shraja's yes, offices? Yes, yes. And lodge a complaint? Perfect. If you look at, at uh, Constitutional Instrument 67, mm. the content of a, a complaint is there. It can be written, it can be oral. In fact, it can be electronic. Okay. Just send it. But you don't really need to sit down and look at uh, the grounds of uh, pleadings and mm -hmm. how you formulate it in a court. You want a declaration, you yes. want an order. Mm -hmm. No. Just let us know what do you want? What has happened to you? What is an injury? that you, you have a problem with. That's what you meant when you began the discussion by using the word informal. Informal. Whilst the courts are formal yes. and they follow procedure, you are informal. Very much. But you are a creature of law, so you must follow legal procedures, otherwise you'll be in trouble. No, that is it. The procedure is set out in the um, Constitutional Instrument 67. Mm. So if you look at Constitutional Instrument 67, Everything in terms of the form and the substance of a complaint is set out. Mm. Once you meet that, you are within the four corners of CI 67, you are done. And did you say you don't take fees? What did you mean by that? Like you don't take a dime? No, no. And like, that, like not one CD? No, no, <laughs> no, no filing fees, nothing. In fact, even if you come, and you don't even have a paper or pen to write your complaint, we will ensure that your complaint is put down for you. Unlike the court, where what you file, you pay for. Right. You pay filing fees. Good. Then if you want to hire a lawyer, you pay the, the lawyer. Good. That this is unnecessary. The completely, completely no, no, opposite. No, no, no. If you don't even have a lawyer, mm. we would tend to become your lawyers. You see, you should, let's appreciate why the, the framers of the Constitution would put such a structure in the Constitution? Mm -hmm. It's because we are not equal. Mm -hmm. We can set up a, a justice system based on money or the available resources, but we must be mindful that this country is full of people who are very poor. And so at the expense of the state, an institution for access to justice must be created. Mm -hmm. And that is what we are there for. And that is why our resources come from the Consolidated Fund. Mm. But we expect that more should be given so that we can do more for the poor. Mm. But when you, you know, explain matters the way you have explained it regarding the complaint, mm -hmm. you don't mean that I can submit, I can come and just say anything without evidence and it will be considered. <laughs> Maybe we need to go through, I mean, maybe we don't have the time, but the truth of the matter is that, unlike the courts, you don't, you need to only let us know, are you injured? Has any human right of yours been violated? Has there been any administrative injustice that has happened to you? Has there been any conflict of interest that has affected the state? That's all that you need to put down. Any matter of corruption. Any matter of corruption, that is what you need to put down. Now, the power given to the commission, unlike a sitting judge, we have special powers of investigation. It is the commission that is to go and look for the evidence. And on the basis of the evidence, come to a conclusion whether looking at, of course, the respondent will be given an opportunity to also comment mm. and to produce evidence. If we come to the conclusion that what the commission has had in terms of evidence based on a complaint and what you have used to defend yourself, the complainant is right. We will give judgment in favor of. In government. legal technical terms, you are an inquisitorial process. Perfect. That's what you do. Perfect. Inquisitorial. Not, 
And that is why a lot of lawyers don't understand the operations of the commission. Mm. The commission, I mean, we, we get complaints of, oh, but let him bring his evidence. Mm -hmm. Let the other side bring evidence. There is no need for that. We, if he has no evidence, it is our duty to look for the evidence. And if we don't get, then on the basis of the fact that there is no evidence, then we conclude that there is no case for the complainant. Mm. Yeah. But there are situations where people have attended you know, complaints to you, mm. and in your preliminary ruling, mm. you have told them that the matter cannot be gone into. Yes. Because there's lack of, you know, uh, what you call a prima facie. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence to proceed on. Right. Which means there's a, a duty on the complainant mm. to find some evidence to back what they bring to you. Not all the time. Not all the time. Okay. When you hear that we've undertaken a preliminary investigation, it means the commission on its own, using its special powers of investigation, based on the allegations you have made, has reached out to the various bodies, and even beyond the bodies that you are complaining against, and has not gotten the evidence. Mm. So in the absence of evidence, given the powers of state that the commission has employed, I mean, we can't, we can't continue with the case. I can understand the practical situation like someone making a complaint that somebody has not complied with the requirements of the constitution to declare their assets. A public official who is supposed to declare their assets has not declared their assets. So you will do your preliminary process to find out if indeed they have declared or they haven't declared. Yeah. All you need is for the person to make the complaint. That's all. Okay. That is an allegation. Mm. So the, that's why the, the Constitution gives us power to write to the Auditor General to provide any evidence of declaration or non-declaration right. on the basis of which we will go ahead mm. to make a determination. Okay. So we <laughs> are having a discussion very interesting and revealing with uh, Commissioner Joseph Wittal and um, we are seeking to be empowered on the processes of charge so that we can also make complaints and uh, use the charge pro processes and as I gave my introduction earlier, there are times when you have contemplated lodging a complaint about your human rights that have been abused or that there has been some administrative injustice against you at your workplace, among others. And you, the first thing you thought of was court. And because you don't have money, you can't afford a lawyer, you gave up. Meanwhile, if you went to Shraj, <laughs> you see what would have happened. Right. Now... Can you give us an idea of how you, know, you, you go through the process to decision yeah. when I bring a complaint? Right. Mm. Good. Um, one key thing is the commission operates its investigations on the basis of natural justice. So as soon as a complaint comes, before any action is taken on it, there's a requirement for us to give the complaint or the allegations contained in the complaint to the respondent, either the person or the institution against which that complaint has been made. And the person is requested. The, res the respondent, in other words, is the person or entity accused, accused. so to speak. So to speak. Mm -hmm. But in our language, it is complainant and respondent. Right. So the respondent is given time. In fact. 10 days at most, within which to make a response or to comment. Mm. And that comment is left to you. If you comment, you don't comment, we'll proceed. Okay. That's natural justice. If you don't, thinking that you are disabling us from, we will go ahead and uh, employ the powers of investigation, either through yourself or the institution or through other bodies where we think the evidence is. And we we'll use that. Then we will then set up the, the, the next stage will be the actual investigation, which is full investigation, mm. where you are written to, you are invited to, that is for uh, full investigation. You are written to, a date is set, uh, an investigator is you know, appointed, and you are supposed to come and be interviewed on the basis of the evidence, and then evidence taken from you orally, mm. and it will be based on 
oath. You give evidence on oath. That can be used against you. Now, after that, when we conclude the evidence st stage, we move on to the stage of where the report is written mm. by the investigators, who will then bring the report to the commission members. The commission members have a duty to go through because it's only the commission when it's a panel investigation or a full investigation. Commission, meaning the three commission members. Yes, the who, commissioner, you, or two deputies. The two deputies. Okay. Who would then give the decision of the commission. So you may hear that an investigation is going in your favor, but that is from the investigators, but the matter comes to the commission and our understanding of it is completely different. We're continuing our discussion and the education we are getting from Commissioner Joseph Wittal, and it continues to be revealing so that for most of you who are familiar that if you went to court and you put allegation like they say, he who alleges must prove. And when they ask you to bring some response of sort and then you don't do anything, um, they ask you to react or bring some comments and you don't do it, where well, you would have expected that in a normal process in a court often the matter will be thrown out. He says no. If you thought that you are going to frustrate them, they won't. They will proceed and give a decision on it. Now, um, since, you know, uh, giving the public an indication that we're going to engage with you, mm -hmm. these are some of the comments that have come in and we have sensit sensitized them into this. That does a commission you know, discriminatorily prioritize uh, so-called high-profile cases over low-profile cases lodged by, you know, um, people or staff against their employers and human rights violations against ordinary citizens. Uh, people recall the speed with which you dealt with cases uh, that are politically involved, people who are politically exposed, like... You know, there was a case against President Mahama. It was dealt with quite swiftly, the Ford saga. Uh, there was a case against Keno Foriata. It was dealt with very quickly. You know, uh, the president's complaint against the PPA boss, uh, Ejenim Boating Ejay, on Manasse Azore's contract for sales documentary, you dealt with it very speedily. Asset declaration complaints against the CJ judges and the Electoral Commission boss. They were dealt with speedily. Question is, do you give a lot of priority to these cases as against cases brought to you by ordinary people against their employers and other things like that? Because some complain that there are delays. No, Samson, no. And you need to really know the statistics of cases that we have. We have, on the average, every year, we, process, we receive about 13,000 complaints throughout the country. We are able to dispose of, that is to resolve, on the average about 10 to 12,000. 13,000 and yes. you're able to resolve up to 12,000. 12,000. You need to go onto our website and see the annual reports. Because I am, I'm leading to something. Mm. You see, we are in the regions. We are in the districts. That's right. The problems there are about minor disputes between a man and his wife, taking a child to school, ensuring that there's harmony at the family level, at the, you know, the community level. So just brutalizing. Good. We have done those stories from Tamale and Perfect. the rest of them. Perfect. Those are the type of complaints that are all over the place. Now, if we're able to dispose of or resolve about 10,000 in a year of such quote-unquote, minor complaints. Mm. And you see the few cases that come up, like the Ford, the PPA, the GRI, and, uh, you know, they are what media like to put attention, attention on. on. But I challenge the media to go into our website and look at the human interest stories mm. that we are resolving day by day for the ordinary Ghanaian, consistent with why the commission has been set up. As for big, grand corruption and allegations of corruption, that is what would always have the attention of Ghanaians. Mm. So you would see that. But it's, there's no discrimination at all. 
But, but how are you able to discharge such an onerous duty with, with uh, such success uh, comparative to, if you compare to other, you know, state institutions responsible for dealing with matters, your rate of success is quite high. Yeah. When we know mm -hmm. the facts over the period is that you don't get money. Not much money. <laughs> That's true. So we, 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 we try to do with what small that is given to us. And to be, to be fair, the state has been trying over time. They've been expanding when we make a strong case mm. to improve upon our budget. That is good. And the human resource. For instance, uh, go back four years. The commission had only about 600 staff strength nationwide. As I speak now, the commission has about 1,084. So within four years, we've grown the commission to almost twice. Mm. And the offices have been opened throughout the country. We are dealing with offices in all the 16 regions. We are now in um, 187 districts. So out of the 261, and I'm sure next year, if things hold and we are able to get clearance, we should, you know, blanket the whole country. By the way, it's a constitutional... I'm uh, impressed. It's a constitutional requirement. Mm, right. In fact, we should have offices throughout in all the branches, in all the districts. I'm very so impressed because, for example, I know that the Labor Commission, which has, you know, a similar sort of attitude mm. when it comes to industrial and employment issues, is supposed to be present all over the country. Yeah. But they currently are not. Um, at my last check, they are present in just about three, four places. Uh, and that's not good enough. Right, so uh, we are having a discussion with uh, Commissioner Joseph Wittal, uh, Commission on Human uh, Rights and Administrative Justice. And I suppose that you have been enjoying the discussion as I am doing myself here. We'll open the phone lines in the next five minutes so that you can join us. Uh, but. On this note, let me say um, congratulations on the recent actual corruption survey, which uh, you did in collaboration with the Statistical Service and uh, United Nations uh, Organization uh, for Drugs um, and, crime. and Crime. You are one of those who believe that official grand corruption can effectively be checked by an effective, unexplained wealth regime. Give us an idea how so, how does that play out? And why Shraj will not activate its own powers to be able to look at public officials and say, when you came to office, you declared your asset. You had only a bicycle. You had only uh, one rented home. But now we can see that you have, you have built or bought you know, five, four mansions in East Legon and very wealthy, you know, expensive places. Your salary cannot explain it. Uh, you have not also received the assets where because somebody hasn't given you the uh, inheritance and so on. Well, um, it's not because we have not tried. We've tried over the years to signal through the investigations we've conducted that okay. came close to how Article 2864, which is on after the first declaration, a public officer who cannot explain the assets that he has to either income, inheritance, and a number of grounds. Right. That those Assets and what are, are deemed to have been acquired illegally and should be confiscated to the state. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two things, substantive and procedural. Substantive is this provision needs to be fleshed out. How do we flesh it out? Because in Chapter 24, we have put before, we've, it has gone before Parliament, it has come back to Cabinet, the Conduct of Public Officers Bill trying to flesh out the whole of chapter 24 on assets declaration, 
on conflict of interest and on oaths. This, unfortunately, this bill is still stuck 10 years since then, mm. before either the parliament or cabinet. We have made, uh, we, 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 in fact, we have sent signals about the recommendations that should attend to Article 2864. That has not been done. Now, if you look at 2864 carefully, mm. And, and let me read it before you say what you want to say. Okay. Uh, that article 2864 that uh, Commissioner uh, Wittal is referring to is, <clears throat> it says that any property, assets acquired by a public officer after the initial declaration required by clause one, declaration of what? Declaration of your asset when you are assuming office <clears throat> of this article and which is not reasonably attributable to income, gifts, loan, inheritance, or any other reasonable source shall be deemed to have been acquired in contravention of this constitution. Right. Perfect. This is a veritable tool to fight corruption in this country. We have made efforts to ensure that this is included in the conduct of public officers bill. It doesn't seem public officers are very enthused about that. That's why it's been sitting in either parliament or cabinet it's been sitting for over either, 10 years. Yes, it has gone, it has even been removed. We have gone before the committees of parliament mm. and they have said, no, this is problematic. That's, it shouldn't go that way. We have made our memoranda to the Attorney General. It has not had the favor that it will, will require it. Now we have Anytime we have the opportunity, for instance, in Jim Mensah, <coughs> and in, I think it was in Jim Mensah, and then the PPA, mm -hmm. we had the opportunity to restate it, and we have sent such decisions to the appropriate body. In fact, we have actually signaled the rules of court committee. Because, you see, if we are going to go to court for forfeiture of assets, unlike OSP and IOKO law, which allow for forfeiture of assets based on conviction. Mm. Ours is not based on conviction. It is going to be a non-conviction based asset forfeiture. So you, you discover that, or somebody makes a complaint to you that, I know, uh, please the phone lines are open now, you can join us. Somebody makes a, um, a complaint to you that, I know, I know something. Before he became uh, a minister or uh, became a public officer, mm. I knew he had just one house, a very small two-bedroom house. But since he assumed office, I have discovered that he has maybe 10-bedroom houses spread across the place. He had just one small car. Now I can see he's got so many of them. Um, he's done so many other things. Once they tell you that, and you also confirm it, you will collect everything, you will seize it to the state without taking the person to court. That's what you mean? No, the other way around. We would in our investigations determine, one, that based on his assets after his first declaration, mm -hmm. he has not been able to explain where his wealth has come from. Okay. And so there is a need to, take, to trigger the process for confiscation. All right. That confiscation, because ours is not conviction-based. We don't go to court to, uh, to prosecute him. Mm. And arising out of the, the prosecution, we want to take uh, consequential action. This has to be non-conviction-based. Okay. Civil action, that would require one. You can see, if you read it carefully, mm. there's a need for the burden to shift. As soon as we are able to, to indicate that, because the explanation he cannot explain, mm. the burden shifts to whoever, public officer, who has acquired the assets and cannot explain, to now explain. Okay. To explain by saying that uh, this is part of it. He got the property from his income, or it was a gift given to him by somebody. It was a loan that he used for the property, or it was an inheritance, Good. or it was some other source of money. Perfect. Which is legitimate. Based on our investigation, he failed to explain, or could not satisfy us. So it will require, we going to court for 
the a confiscation order. All right. So you just go to court to get the property seized, seized. but not for any sanctions against the person. At least it, it can be added. But okay. this aspect has to come in. That's what you but mean by non-conviction based. Non-conviction based. Mm. But the problem that lies in wait for Article 2864 uh, uh, implementation is that you would have to, the burden has to shift. And you know the evidence decree. Mm -hmm. We, the burden is on the commission mm. to first come and justify that he could not explain. Right. So when it shifts, where is the rule in the, the current um, Evidence, Evidence Act? Act? Mm. It's not there. Right. Where is the CI 47? Where is the rule? Mm. That's a problem. So these are the tools you need change so that you'll be able to trigger this Perfect. and help the country. Perfect. Uh, Jephthah or Jaffet, you're calling us from Tamale. When you're done, Evans, um, you are also in Kumasi. Let's hear you. Yes, uh, Mr. Samson, thank you so much and for this program. And I want to thank the commissioner so much. Mm -hmm. But there's something that I also want us to look at especially at district offices. Mm -hmm. I don't know. When you go there, it's just like there's nobody there, and the office is just which, in the which, house. Which particular so don't, office? Don't generalize. Which particular yes, office? Yes, I, what, exactly the Salga office, the Salga district office, for example. Okay. It's neglected. There are no staff there. When you go there, nobody to see. Right. Um, you've gone there how many times? When? I've gone there like, I've gone there like four times. In fact, I work there, sir. Okay. Yes. You work there? Yes, I work in Salga, not particularly uh, for security reasons. I work in Salga. Okay. And, yes. and when, when was this that you visited the place and there were no... Uh... Yes, I was, I, was, I was there on Wednesday and that of Tuesday. Okay. You have a complaint yes. you want to make there? No, I just... Uh, I, have, I have an interest there, so I've been going there to look at certain things because of the commissioner, his work. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Jafet. Uh, Evans... All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, please, I would like to find out, do we have specific time frame for, let's say, various complaints? All right, Hello? time frame for complaints. Thank you. Yes, for example, if maybe there's this particular complaint that you said, maybe within three years, two years, and if you don't complain, then the time has elapsed, and by so you cannot complain again. Do we have time frame for such Oh, okay, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Evans. Uh, Abdul, Abdul, you are yes. calling. You are in Amasaman. Let's hear you. Um, good afternoon, Samson. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, I would like to know from your guest. What if the person transfers that particular property into someone into someone into someone's name? Secondly, I just want to say, know. Say that, that again. Uh, say that again. What what? I, yeah, I say that. I want to know what if the person. Transfer the, his property into someone's uh, someone's name. What about I that? Mean, what about that? Uh, to avoid to avoid investigation or for him. Uh, okay, concealment, that. concealment of the property. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Gordon. Uh, thank you. We'll give you one opportunity, Gordon. Gordon, uh, yes, you are uh, in a table. Let's hear you, Gordon. Thank you very much, uh, mm -hmm. Um uh, We have a problem with uh, the court. In fact. Somebody defaulted that by uh, uh, defaulting by false pretenses. A warrant was issued to us by the Sunyani Regional Police Headquarters to take the warrant to uh, a certain place, Nandom, for an arrest to be made. I presented the warrant, and then the police commander said there was a higher authority instructing him never to effect the warrant. As I speak now, we are confused. We don't know what exactly to know. Our right has been trampled upon. But I'm so grateful to the commissioner this afternoon. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, my last call will be Mohammed. Mohammed, you are calling. You are in Tamil. Let's hear you. Yeah. Good afternoon. Let's hear you. Yeah, please. Uh, I want to find out if you are a staff of an organization and you, and you are transferred and uh, you are supposed to pay a transfer grant and you have not received your transfer grant, do you have the right to stay back? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so if we can begin with uh, Mohammed. Yes. Well... You will need to lodge a complaint. Yeah, you need to lodge a complaint. Mm -hmm. And of course, he hasn't indicated that they have refused to pay. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, the process is like that. 
we've been dealing with such cases. Right. They need to apply through the process and then that money will come through finance and all that. And if finance has not given them, that becomes a problem for the institution. Admittedly, oftentimes there's such undue delay in those processes yeah. in the public office. Mm -hmm. uh, you heard Gordon mm -hmm. about the police uh, getting a warrant and all these issues. <laughs> what should he do? <laughs> you see, um, that, is, that comes under our uh, ombudsman mandate. Delay in carrying out the work of a public institution. The police have a discretion. But the if the delay is inordinate, you can apply to us. We will ensure that we we'll go over the head of the person based on investigation mm. to ensure that the next person, his superior, ensures that the right thing is done. So Gordon should go to the nearest uh, Shraj office? Yes, and then lodge a complaint. And on the basis of that, we will approach his the the one who is frustrating him, mm -hmm. the boss, the policeman's boss, either the okay. district commander or anybody higher. Mm. Abdul's question is straightforward. Uh, what if the property you are going to chase to confiscate has been concealed, is been given to somebody else? You shouldn't worry. <laughs> These are matters that have been well taken care of. Mm. They're dealing with tracing. Right. You can always know where, whoever owned the property. At what stage it was uh, the, the title passed. Okay. You can know that. Right. And then we can still know that you are trying to conceal mm. because at the time title passed, it was when the action was on. Okay. So it's not a problem at all. Once the action commences yeah. and you find that the, the ownership changed yes. once the action commenced, then there's a presumption of concealment. Okay, that there's an attempt yes. to hide it. Good. All right. Uh, Evans in Kumasi, he's talking, asking whether there are time frame, uh, frames for when one can bring a complaint or not bring a complaint. Yes, Evans is right. I mean, there's a time frame. There is, um, if you look at Article, um, no, Section 13 of Act, Act 456, that is our, our Act, it's a year. Every complaint must be brought within a year of the complainant getting to know of the complaint. If you don't bring it within time, you are indolent. Okay. And the Supreme Court has pronounced on that on two different occasions, talking about the Attorney General charge versus Attorney General, and then Ghana Commercial Bank versus charge. Okay. You must we must stay within the 13 months unless. I mean, the, the, one, the one, one, year, one year, unless we are able to justify why we would exercise our discretion in favor of beyond a one year. Well, we, are, we are very careful about that. But you are able to extend the time for people? Yes, we can. People after the, one year. The, the, the Supreme Court allows us mm. on the basis of justification mm. to, to extend, extend the it. time. Right. Okay. Then to Jaffet. Uh, the Salga office. He says he's been there Wednesday a number of times and the place doesn't seem to be active. Right. Um, let me assure Jaffet, it's good information. Mm. We will use that to get the director administra uh, the administration and human resource to get in touch with the Salga office. Mm. We will get to the bottom of it. Right. Why people were not in the office mm. and, and I'm sure at the appropriate time, if he can call us through our website, we will get in touch with him to give him the reason. Right. And to uh, know what action we have taken. <laughs> right. Yeah. And my, my final question to you would be uh, whether there's one or some two uh, major issues of concern to you about governance, questions of uh, justice delivery, mm -hmm. um, or social justice that concern you mm -hmm. uh, presently and what you would want to be done about that. Right. Thank you. I've articulated one already, yes. which is the conduct of public office bill. Mm -hmm. If all the conflict of interest situations, which is in the news, mm -hmm. and the corruption in the news is anything to go by, there is the, the basis, this is basis for us to ensure that this bill sees the light of day. I don't understand it. From a practitioner's point of view, we want to do our work. Okay. Why do you disable us? Mm -hmm. I'm talking of parliament and cabinet. These are the two bodies that are keeping. We have done our part. Now on social justice, uh, we're talking about a country such as Ghana, 
we have made an effort as far back as 15 years ago, another legislation, I'm talking about Affirmative Action Bill. Rwanda and other countries have gone ahead of us. What, what is it? Is it that we don't, we don't value our women? Mm. We don't want half of the population to be very much productive? Why are we doing this? So again, our challenge is before parliament, and the right honorable speaker actually indicated that. He will prioritize it. I hope he will do that. Mm. Thank you so very much. Uh, this has been the law. It's your legal light. It's your health law. And our guest has been Commissioner Joseph Wittal. Um, your middle name, I just discovered that <laughs> it's never, you know, um, <laughs> pronounced really or talked about. How do you pronounce your middle name? It's Akanjoli Nur. It's, um, it's a bully name right. from Sandema mm. Chief House. What does it mean? It means, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't stay with people. I don't enter with people locally. Mm. But that means I'm somebody who likes to operate on my own. OK. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Vital, thank you so very much for making time to join us to thank educate you. our audiences. And I suppose that uh, you're going to get uh, in excess of 13,000 cases. Thank you so much. Thank you. And let's do this once again. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. This has been The Law. It's your legal light. It's your help law. I'm Samson Ladi Anyanini. We come your way next week, God willing. <laughs>